Previously on the British Broadcasting Century podcast. It's early March 1923, and the BBC now consists of six stations from London to Glasgow, all within four months of Auntie Beebe's first baby steps. As for the seventh station, well, that wouldn't come along for another seven months. That would be back in Scotland for Aberdeen's 2BD in October. But for now, British Broadcasting is finding its feet in London, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle, Cardiff and Glasgow under a staff of amateurs, aficionados and a laundry basket. <laughs> This time, after exploring the last days at Magnet House in London, that's the first one-room BBC HQ, we'll go on tour with the early variety artists around those early stations, and we'll meet a much more recent BBC comedy star who is also touring the land. We will say Heidi hi to Geoffrey Holland. We only had three channels. Uh, that was it. You know, we were pulling nearly twenty million a week when we were doing Heidi High. You know, at its peak in the mid mid eighties. But you know, you can't do that now. It's just it's not physically possible to get the cable channels. You know, and all the rest of it. Families don't sit down to watch TV anymore like they used to do when they watched Heidi High. You know, mum, mum and dad, the kids and grandma. You know, um, I mean, it was good, clean family fun, and they they don't do that now. Comedy star Geoffrey Holland and an insight into the studios and characters of the BBC of spring of 1923. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm on episode 64 of the British Broadcasting Century. Hello, hello. This is Paul Carenza calling. This is London Calling. Hello, hello, I'm Paul Carenza. You're you, last time I checked, and welcome to this podcast, telling the long tale of British broadcasting, which just happens to be about the BBC to begin with. But this is not a BBC podcast, do you hear? And it is indeed a long tale of British broadcasting. So this time we're on episode 64. It's March 1923, March the 1st to March the 16th. That's what we're covering this time. Now, often on this podcast, it's a tale of firsts. We've recently had the first Scottish station, the first Welsh station, and that's partly why we're going so slowly. You see, there are lots of landmark moments that were firsts. We will pick up and we will zip faster through the timeline. We will accelerate once the early broadcasters stop doing things for the first time. We were always starting something new, trying things for the first time, and wondering how they'd come off. Our Rex Palmer there, reflecting on so many firsts. He was there at Marconi House in London in the early months as station director of 2LO and announcer and singer as Rex Faithful and even a children's presenter as Uncle Rex. So this time, yes, rather than any major firsts as such, we have a few minor firsts and we will give you more of a, a snapshot of what the early BBC was like at this point. Now, six stations have launched across the land and that includes the studios and the characters. So why March the 16th as the end point of this episode. Well, that is when the BBC leave their first home of Magnet House, the headquarters with now 30 staff operating out of this one-room BBC. This is the beginning of the end of the beginning. They start to make their move to the first permanent home of Savoy Hill. We got better organised with studios and offices at Savoy Hill, but it was still pretty hectic in those early days. Now, that won't properly have its big launch until May the 1st, so we're a few episodes off celebrating Savoy Hill just yet. But this felt like a good episode to start to say farewell to their first headquarters of Magnet House and the first London studio of Marconi House just up the road. To start with, of course, we had only that one room at the top of Marconi House, which was our studio, office, rehearsal room experimental lab and, and everything else. Because, yeah, in those earliest days, there were two London BBCs. There was head office and the studio, a few roads apart. Now, some people worked at both, like the very first voice of the BBC, Arthur Burroughs, and his deputy, Cecil Lewis. They would run through the streets of London at the end of each workday to become broadcasters of an evening. So I was curious about this route from Magnet House to Marconi House, and I went to visit. The round building there, that's called Space House. And the square covered building there, really next to it here on Kingsway in the middle of London. That's where the General Electric Company used to be. And uh, that's where Magnet House was. That's the very first BBC home, really, right there. From uh, December 1922 for the first few months until they moved into Savoy Hill, which is just down the way here. But in um, Cecil Lewis's books, the, uh, the Broadcasting from Within book, and Arthur Burroughs' The Story of Broadcasting, they talk about how they would go from Magnet House to Marconi House to broadcast. They would work in the head office there by day, and then they would go this way. Let's walk and talk. Why, why am I not walking and talking sooner? I'm going to 
really just give you a sense of how far it was between Magnet House, the daytime headquarters, and Marconi House, the evening studio. They would race down this street on a diet of beer and meringues, according to Cecil Lewis's book, Broadcasting from Within. From morning to night, the office was bombarded by the press, the public, the wireless manufacturers, people of every kind and class who, for some reason or other, were interested in broadcasting. There was no time for lunch. A cup of coffee and a few sandwiches would be swallowed at intervals between dealing with correspondence and seeing countless people. We're sort of on the, uh, just, uh, just north of the Thames here is really where we are. We're getting on the edge of theatre land here. Now. So while I make so that walk from Magnet House to Marconi House, just as the early pioneers would have done each day as programme directors by day and broadcasters by night, we'll check in again in a little while but leave the clock running so we do get a sense of how long it would take to get from A to B. Before we check in again with that walk then, let's meet this week's guest. We'll be talking about comedy and variety on the early Beeb, so who better to speak to than a giant of BBC comedy in the 1980s from Heidi High, Yurang Malord, O Dr Beeching, guest parts in Dad's Army and It Ain't Half Hot Mum. This is the comedy legend that is Geoffrey Holland. All the Perry and Croft stuff is set in the past before, you know, that it, it'll never date because it's it's historical anyway, you know. All the, all their work, Dad's Army, Ain't Half Hot, you know, set in the war. Uh, and of course, you rang the Lord, the, the wonderful, brilliant series that is so underestimated, is, is was always my favourite personally and uh, David Croft's favourite as well. That was set in the 20s. The original yeah. You Rang the Lord was uh, to set in the 30s in the abdication years. But Mary Husband, the costume designer, was a, you know, a dear friend of Jimmy Perry anyway, said, no, don't set it in the 30s, set it in the 20s because the costumes for the ladies were so much nicer. You know, and of course they were, they were sensational. Let's talk about Croft and Perry. So many things that then been part of your wonderful career. We think yeah. of Heidi High, you rang my lord. But actually, your your way into the Croft Perry story, I was vaguely aware that you did Dad's Army on stage, and yeah. I was thinking that must be a, a later version. But it, this was when it was still on television, wasn't it? Nineteen seventy five. It was still big. It didn't finish till seventy seven. We did the stage show, um, and I was recruited in, into the company there as a, one of the ensemble, really, just to you know sing in a dance a movie about changing costumes, playing silly buggers and running around all evening. And I had to understudy Pike and understudy Walker. I actually did go on as Pike once in a matinee because Ian Lavender was busy doing something. He was supposed to be ill, but he wasn't. He was actually filming. <laughs> <laughs> but I went on as Pike and uh, and got all the words out in the right order. I was very proud, but nothing. I got no laughs at all. From, oh. You know, it was just no. I wasn't Ian Lavender, you see. They were deeply unforgiving. It's harsh. It's a brutal world, isn't it? But, you know, it's it's quite a rare thing then to be playing the part of one of these people while that actor is still playing that part on TV and on stage. Yeah, yeah. and of course, uh, and then I understood Walker as well. When we toured the show in, in the spring of 76, uh, John Barton, who'd been booked to play Walker uh, because James Beck had already died two years before, uh, John Barton uh, didn't want to do the tour. He... he um, who got other stuff to do? So they they came to me. Jimmy rang me up and said, "Would I like to play Walker? Would I like to play Walker?" <laughs> I think he bit his arm off, you know. And uh, it was it was easy for them because I'd understudied it. I knew that I knew the lines, you know. They, were, they didn't need any rehearsal, and uh, they were saving a salary. So <laughs> so yes, I played Walker as well, and I was a member of Captain Mannering's platoon for six months. Wonderful. And were the audience more forgiving than when you were Pike then? Did they let you get away with Walker a bit more? They all knew James Becker died. Of course. Oh, that's true. That is a very good point. That is a very good point. They will. So you're on stage then with Arthur Lowe and... On the uh, I've done. Uh, the Ed Lavender, yeah. John Laurie didn't do the show because he was rather old then and uh, his wife wasn't well, so he stayed at home. But uh, we had a, a replacement. Uh, then when he left and didn't do all the tour, we had a, just another actor playing another character, just to swell the numbers, really. And Arnold Ridley, actually, who, who always looked about 90, actually turned 80 on the tour. I mean, he was a professional old man, Arnold Ridley. <laughs> Wonderful man. He was a sweetheart, absolute sweetheart. But, you know, he was there too, and he did his bit, and, you know, fantastic. More from Geoffrey Holland shortly, but let's check in on that commute that I was recreating between Magnet House, the BBC HQ, and Marconi House, the BBC studios of 2LO London. Marconi's on this site, the Gaiety Theatre, built in 1903 for impresario George Edwards, the home of musical comedy, one of London's most famous playhouses. Well, I know about the Gaiety Theatre because I keep seeing it in the listings as 
that's one of the very earliest places they would broadcast to. As for the building we've uh, come from, from Magnet House, there was a sign outside it saying BBC Walk In, and no one knows where that sign is today. The one room the BBC was allowed at Magnet House was 30 foot by 15 foot, and the rest of the building was stock rooms and a big warehouse for the General Electric Company. That one room had a library, as they called it, which was just a packing case in the corner filled with music and electrical items, bits of wire. More later on what may have happened to some of that music. Yes, it went on tour. But speaking of tour, Paul the Commuter is just about to complete the route from the old BBC HQ of Magnet House to the old BBC studio, Marconi House. And I believe now we are approaching it here. This, this is it. Look at this. Marconi House within this building. Marconi's wireless telegraph company limited operated their famous broadcasting station Tuolo from May 11th to November the 14th, 1922, when it became the first station of the British Broadcasting Company. So we've made it. This is Marconi House, as it now is a fancy bar and fancy flats. As for Marconi House then, Tuolo London Studio, where we now find ourselves at the end of this walk, it had a piano that was described as an upright that wasn't quite. It was all a bit make-do. The microphone was slung across the room by wires and just fixed in place with bits of sticky tape. And as for the transmitter, well, the circuit could only be completed if you dropped a coin into the gap between the two points. Occasionally then, just to make a broadcast happen, the engineer had to borrow sixpence from Wreath. If we didn't have the coin, the broadcast couldn't go ahead. We should start a BBC superstition, shouldn't we? That every engineer can only start a broadcast if they've got sixpence in their pocket. All right, 50p, inflation. And as for that microphone, it was just a switch. There was no fader. If you pulled it out, it would stop. Although some people did that a little too early. I remember the bishop. His chief engineer, Peter Eckersley. Who was preaching a sermon. Uh, bishops were there, too. In those days, let me make it clear... There was no fade out in the control room with a careful engineer with a couple of knobs which he just got to turn in a counterclockwise direction for all I know to make it go to naught. There was just on the edge of the microphone a switch and you plucked it out when it stopped and you put it in when it was alive. The bishop had finished his sermon something like this and I am sure my dear friends if all of us observe these precepts one and all of us will go to heaven. I don't think I spoke too long, did I? Well, it came out after think. Peter Eckersley there. By now, he was running the engineering department. Well, himself and just one or two others. He had a pretty free reign to do that as well. This was what was agreed when Reith interviewed him just the month before. Reith said, you can have free reign as long as you come up with the goods. God help you if you don't. Do you get my meaning? Eckersley replied that he was unlikely to need God's help, more likely the help of the Institution of Electrical Engineers. Reith had concluded the interview, sending Peter off to get a new dark suit and lose his tatty shoes. Yes, the boss had to have the last word. Let's check in then on some other London pioneers. How about Peter Eckersley's nemesis from the pre-BBC days, Arthur Burroughs? There was no precedent, no store of experience to be tapped, no staff ready to hand with metal proved in a similar field. It was all left to us. First voice of the BBC. Well, it was said that Burroughs takes adverse criticism to heart almost too seriously, as if it were directed against him personally. No matter how heavy the work, he invariably comes up with a smile. He is sometimes too gentle with those who deserve tougher treatment. Out of office hours, he refuses to talk shop. He has a vast memory for people, and the organisation and interest with which they are connected. These character profiles appear in Cecil Lewis's book, Broadcasting from Within. I remember very well our first, what you might call our first company meeting, which is on the corner of the pavement, uh, uh, between where you come down Kingsway and there you start to see the the, the crescent of, of Bush House at the bottom there you know? and we were standing on that corner and I remember Reith, you know, standing and he was rather smartly dressed, much smart, more smartly dressed than we were. The voice there of Cecil Lewis himself. Cecil Lewis and Arthur Burroughs were deputy and director of programmes and now we're a few months into the BBC they're beginning to focus more on what tone and taste the BBC should be aiming for. Cecil Lewis particularly specified four things. To cater for the majority, but remembering minorities. The upper side of taste. Impartial debate. Well, we heard an ill-fated attempt at that a couple of episodes ago. And religious broadcasts, non-dogmatic and non-sectarian. Well, that pleased John Reith, certainly. Seriously, in the religious aspect of life, and Sundays were sacred and Sundays were sacrosanct, and he wouldn't have him missed about with and so he really set standards for the BBC. From his book, Broadcasting from Within, the first book on broadcasting. What is meant by the upper side of public taste? 
Well, we strive, as far as possible, to avoid certain things, desirable or undesirable, according to the point of view, which are as readily or more fully obtainable elsewhere, such things, for instance, as sensational murder details or unsavoury divorce cases. These things appeal strongly to the curiosity of certain types of people. They can always be read in cold print. But reading, after all, is a private thing between the reader and the matter read. Many things, harmless-looking enough in print, sound very different read aloud. Besides this, children may always be listening, and there seems no point in blurting out things of this kind to the young unnecessarily. Apart from all this, what justification is there for dragging into prominence the seamy side of private life? Is anyone the better for it? And I think there, in plain speaking, right from the start, is what stands the BBC apart from many other broadcasters still to this day. Or am I just an idealist? Of course, we could probably increase the number of our subscribers in a few weeks by changing our policy on these things. He, of all people, there particularly veered away from news. He'd seen too much death and destruction as a World War I flying ace. We were hooked on the idea of entertainment, Lewis later claimed. He wanted broadcasting more than anything as distraction. And up in Birmingham as well, the station director there, the second voice of the BBC to Arthur Burroughs' first voice, Percy Edgar certainly agreed. It would have been so easy to have concentrated our aim upon the lowest common denominators of popular taste, and in doing so to have failed utterly to make the most of our opportunities for enriching the public mind. Well, Cecil Lewis wanted entertainment, and if that's what you want, we're delighted that just over half a century later, the BBC comedy department welcomed Geoffrey Holland. Having done the Dad's Army stage show in 75 and 76, I did an episode in in the final series of Dad's Army, so I played an army truck driver, you know, don't blink. But uh, of course, when Heidi High came up a few years later in 79, when they wrote the pilot, they wrote Spike with me in mind, which was wonderful, you know, for me, I was thrilled to bits. So Heidi Hive, this is where I'm first aware of your great work as Spike Dixon, particularly with great Miss Paul Shane as Ted Bovis. They, they searched a long time before they found Ted Bovis. Jimmy saw him on Coronation Street quite by chance and rang David up and said, David, are you watching Corey? He said, no. I said, put it on quick. I think we've found Ted Bovis. And there he was playing Alf Robert's boss in Corey. Yeah, it was perfect. And it was a sort of rough diamond they were looking for, you know, with the same northern accent. And, and he was perfect when I met him. Uh, I came down to, to London to read a couple of scenes with me because they, they already had booked me, Spike. And I met him for the first time and the, the, the chemistry was instant. You know, there was just a magical ping. Something went click. And we we just bounced off each other straight away. And it was it was incredible. I think, you know, all the all the years we worked together, we were together for 18 years altogether. And, uh, and all, all of those other shows as well, Heidi High and then You Rang My Lord and Oh Dr. Beeching, it always felt, it's like you, you two, the scenes with you two in it, just sparked. We had the magical chemistry that it just sort of worked, and uh, David was very clever in the way he had exploited that, you know. And he wrote stuff for us that would work, and he, he did. It was wonderful. And and your live show then, uh, when you play Stan Laurel, and this is my friend, Mister Laurel. Tell us about about that and how that's been taken up. Yes, yeah, just on three nights for the, uh, the, the the Rural Touring Association, various village halls. Which uh, is quite an experience. It was something I wanted to do way way back. You know, as a small boy, sort of saw them on the Saturday morning picture shows. But I, you know, we used to go to the pictures back in the seventies when I was a young actor, really just starting out. They started to show Laurel and Hardy on BBC Two in the evening, six o'clock-ish, an alternative to the news on BBC Two. And then, and then my, my love for them was sort of rekindled at that time, you know. And I and one, one person shows were becoming quite the vogue in the theatre at the time as well. I sort of thought and decided that wouldn't it be a good idea to do a one-man show about Stan Laurel, for me personally, because uh, it's a fantastic story. But, you know, I, I knew that I had to wait. I was too, in my 20s. I couldn't a one-man show. And, you know, you can't do, tell a life story until you've had a life. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> and uh, I had to wait. And I did. I waited. I knew it would happen when it was meant to. And it was in my life. The moment would come when it was would sit right. Mm. And, uh, and it would drop into place. And it did. I found a wonderful writer, quite by chance. And we collaborated on the Mr. Laurel. And it dropped into place exactly the right time in my life but she decided and i think it was quite right too to set the play in oliver hardy's sick bedroom it was his life he had a massive stroke 
and he lay in bed for nearly a year before he died. Uh, and Stan used to go and visit him, you know, and then come away in tears because it broke his bloody heart, you know, to see this dear friend in that state. So she set the play in that bedroom the year before he died, which was 1956. Stan was 66. And when we got this play up on its feet for the very first time, I was 66. Perfect. Look at um, that. It couldn't be more right. Serendipity. Yeah. I'm 76 now. I mean, it's no secret. It's, it's uh, you know, it's all dropped into place. And I'm still doing it. And uh, and it was there. It, 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 the timing was perfect. And uh, and it's been a big success for me so far. Well, look out for your for the show again. And yeah, I'll put the uh, your website and the details in, in the show notes of this podcast. So people who want to find out more, they can. It's my mind playing tricks. There's a scene, Laurel and Hardy, of Spike and, and Ted Bobus, isn't there? Is that right? There is a, uh, yes, there is a Laurel and Hardy input into one episode. It was mm-hmm. called It's a Blue World. We're talking about Laurel and Hardy in the office because Paul and I used to mess around doing Laurel and Hardy in rehearsal just for fun. Uh, and uh, and David and Jimmy you know, picked up on it and they wrote this uh, particular episode where, where um, Ted wants to show a naughty film to the male campers after midnight in, in the cafe. And he hires this film projector. Now, the police arrive. The inspector says, turn that projector on, Constable. Let's find out what's at the bottom of all this. And he turns it on, and all you hear is, it did it, it did it, like yeah, yeah. the movie. And then at the, the last line is, I just look at him and I say, well, it's another nice mess I've gotten you out, Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Wonderful. And when we did the stage show, the summer show of Heidi High, which we did for you know, two summers in 83 and 84, and the uh, Christmas season at the Victoria Palace in between, we did uh, Laurel and Hardy singing the Trail of the Lones and Pine, you know, every night, twice mm. nightly, live. Mm. Sang it live, dressed as Laurel and Hardy. So we 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 got our we got our money's worth. Back in 1923, it's March. We've been from Magnet House, BBC HQ, to Marconi House, London 2LO Studio. But let's look a little further afield then to West London and Olympia. Now that's one place that London 2LO was radiating to. They had three times a day at the Daily Mail Ideal Home Exhibition broadcasts from the London studio showcasing what radio was and could be. There were 42 stands there as part of the first radio exhibition by the National Association of Radio Manufacturers. Same month there was the All British Wireless Exhibition up in Manchester so radio was being sold to the people and in fact just going into production that month was the first radio set that incorporated a loudspeaker. Up until this point, all previously produced sets had required the use of headphones. But now, gather round, family. The radio was replacing the piano in the family home. So how do you sell radio at the Ideal Home Exhibition? I should say the Daily Mail Ideal Home Exhibition, of course. The Daily Mail, still loosely involved in broadcasting at this point, then having sponsored the Melba broadcast three years earlier. Still to come, they would try their own Daily Mail pirate radio station off the east coast of Britain in the late 1920s. The Daily Mail were there at the very start of broadcasting, but then frustrated at not being allowed to have a licence. But at this point then, 1st of March, here's what was on the London 2 schedule to advertise radio to the exhibition goers and the home listeners. Well, 3 to 4pm, you had Madame Lily Paling singing Home Sweet Home, just as Nellie Melba had done three years earlier. There was also Land of Hope and Glory and Annie Laurie, Softly Awakes My Heart. These are all familiar tunes that date right back to when Arthur Burroughs was broadcasting on London 2 the year before. It's a very limited playlist, hand-selected by the Director of Programmes at the BBC. Next day, Friday 2nd of March, the first morning and afternoon programmes on the BBC. Yes, BBC Daytime was here. The day after that, you sort of have a pre-women's hour. It was pretty much the first women's talk from Florence Roberts on the trend of fashion. Cecil Dixon, the first BBC accompanist, was playing the piano. And the Ideal Home Exhibition broadcasts continue throughout the month of March. March the 9th, for example, apparently the first reading of a short story by Gilbert Franco. March the 13th looks like a nice different broadcast. It was Philip Wilson's talk on the songs of the 16th and 17th century illustrated. Eight songs were performed mid-talk. And then Act 2 of the pantomime Cinderella, live from the Hippodrome, another outside broadcast. A favourite of mine this month is March the 16th. From 3 to 4pm, you could hear the two Bobs singing songs of their numbers from the court theatre production Carte Blanche. (laughs) They would sing Carolina in the morning, put some ginger in it, what's his name, and Paddy McGinty's goat. Now, if none of those songs mean anything to you, me neither, but they all sound brilliant, especially when sung, I imagine, by the two Bobs. 
Here's someone else known for his marvellous double act over the years with the brilliant Paul Shane. Here's Geoffrey Holland. During 86, when we were doing the penultimate series of Heidi High, they, David and Jimmy told us about the, the following year would be the last Heidi High, but we would be going on. Uh, Paul, Sue and I knew that we were going on to do Your Own Lord, which was a very different Paul and I were rehearsing the first scene when we were shooting the pilot, with the big scene in the uh, the battle battlefield it was like the Somme when we were outdoors, and uh, we were rehearsing in the re- rehearsal room where we'd rehearsed Heidi High for eight years. We, it was very difficult for me to call him Alf, and for him to call me James. We used to call each other Ted and Spike all the time. It was. <laughs> Difficult to get your head around that. Uh, and and the, the affection that we had for those shows as well. And then Oh Dr. Beeching as well. Uh, again. They, they cut that short. They axed it mm. far too soon. You know, BBC was going through a, a change, a big change in the, the, the mid, mid-90s. I had control of BBC One. Peter Salmon, he was then he's back in sport now where he belongs, I think. But it, uh, it, was, it was him that it was quoted as having said, I don't want any more net curtain comedy. Oof. I think he meant good, clean family fun. Mm. You know, because TV comedy was going down the road of men behaving badly and stuff like that, which was no, fine, don't get me wrong. Mm. I'm knocking it because it was well written and well played by those that did it. But it was just, you know, evolution. Things mm. never stay the same. Things change. And that's what was happening at the Beeb. And, and the, he didn't want any more of that type of comedy that, that David Croft had been writing and producing for years. So that, that got the axe after just the second series. But it was a shame because there was so much more mileage we could have got out of that. Mm. You know, I started to write uh, bits for it then right. but they, because they never, they never came to the screen because we never, mm. we never did another series. But there you go. It's a shame because, as, and it is a shame because it's not just the act coming down on O oh, Dr. Beeching, but on that sort of show as well. And as you said, it's that it is the evolution, you know, but it's one person's opinion, arguably. But I remember we, we did um, only a handful of years after that, maybe 10 years after, maybe. Um, I worked on uh, still writing for Not Going Out, the Lee Max sitcom, and that debuted on BBC One the same night that on BBC Two they had a documentary called The Death of Sitcom, and it was really saying that the office and the single camera show had replaced the studio audience sitcom. We were nervously watching it going, but we've got a studio audience sitcom on the same night on the other channel, you know, but it does feel like the studio audience sitcom, that era, is we're clinging on, but there's not, the world changes, I suppose, but... uh... So need an audience, a studio audience for a, for a comedy on TV. Really do. I believe that wholeheartedly. And, and attempts have been made to do sitcoms without an audience. You know, and you don't... Well, how can I put it without making it sound patronising? But you don't know when to laugh. The studio audience tell you when to laugh at home. You know, and it's all part of the comedy, all part of the fun. You know, it lifts you and carries you along with it. And that's how, you know, studio audiences, to me, are essential. And the ones that exploited it, you know, Vicar of Dibley was wonderful because that had a, an audience. And, and Mrs. Brown's Boys, I mean, he exploits the audience and he exploits his, his fellow actors, bless him, you know, it? You even do a theatrical bow at the end of it in front of the audience. So we see the audience, we see all the cameras because we know they're there. Exploits it and makes the best of it, I think. That's wonderful. <laughs> So back in March 1923, we've gone from Magnet House to Marconi House. We've explored what was broadcast at Olympia for the Ideal Home Exhibition. Let's go further afield then on tour. We said at the start of the episode, there were now six BBC stations that had popped up within four months of its beginning. These half dozen regional stations. And at this point, they had a lot more autonomy just for a little while. That soon vanished when London took over, once simultaneous broadcasting came in. In other words, London could broadcast on all stations. But for a few brief months, that meant lots of local acts. But as we know, the microphone Cecil Lewis described as the most voracious of beasts, a monster ever hungry for more content. Feed me. Now, one way to feed that monster of a microphone was touring acts. This was the start then, really, of the London takeover. They would send favourite acts from London, they'd work well on 2LO, and they then travel around the country and perform at the other stations. Maurice Cole, for example, the first pianist of the BBC, was often to be found in Cardiff and Glasgow and Birmingham and Manchester, Newcastle. These familiar comedians and musicians who appeared at Marconi House would then do a tour of all the BBC stations 
before coming back to London to gain a new repertoire. Now, another way to fill the station's schedules was to dispatch a weekly laundry basket to various city wireless stations. It was a laundry basket filled with sheet music and gramophone records. Now, the contents were chosen carefully by Arthur Burroughs and Stanton Jeffries at head office. Again, see earlier for details on the upper side of taste and Arthur Burroughs' intense attention to detail for which songs were worthy of broadcast. On one occasion, a laundry basket delivered to the Bournemouth studios in Holdenhurst Road actually found its way to the local laundrette. That would make some very clean sheet music indeed. So you can see that at this point, the provincial stations still had control, but BBC head office was gradually influencing the playlist. And don't we see that today? Who gets to choose what local stations play? Do you put the choice in the hands of the people in the studio, or do you decide what's best at a centralised office? Well, within a third of a year, the BBC had decided that London knew best. And once simultaneous broadcasting comes in that summer of 1923, London could take even more control, thanks to Reith's vision and Peter Eckersley's technical innovations. Now, I'm not saying this is necessarily a good or bad thing. It does mean that the other stations could benefit from performers who were, for example, on in London's West End, or MPs from the House of Commons. But it did impact on things like the accents you would hear on local stations, the local variety scenes. We all know what happened to the musical scene that came out of the Victorian era. Radio would use some of its stars, but not all of them, and local culture was gradually being replaced. Reith was genuinely concerned at this point that some stations needed help. Having just launched Glasgow on March the 6th, by March the 11th, Reith was noting, A.E. Thompson of Glasgow here. The station is doing badly, and I sent Eckersley North. Now, A.E. Thompson, you may recall, started the Birmingham station. Everything we were transmitting sounded as though it was coming out of a biscuit box. So then I sent somebody down into the town and said, buy yards and yards of woollen material. We've got to drape these walls. Known as Uncle Thompson, he began the children's hour. And so now Thompson was in Glasgow, helping that one off the ground. This sort of movement happened quite a lot in the early months. A skilled station director or engineer would move to a newer station that needed a safer pair of hands. So that was March the 11th. Moving on then through our timeline, three days later, March 14th, over the water, Pete Parker called the play-by-play of the first ice hockey game ever broadcast on radio in its entirety. That was between the Regina Capitals and the Edmonton Eskimos of the Western Canada Hockey League. Same day back here, Leonard Crocombe, founding editor of the Radio Times later in 1923, he starts broadcasting his regular humorous slot, Titbits, based on his magazine, Titbits. I contributed a talk, alleged to be funny, month by month, from each of the six stations of those days. An Australian came over to London for a holiday, and is introduced to many people, amongst whom was an old Scotchman. And this old Scotchman worried the Australians with hundreds and hundreds of questions about Australia. And he finished up by saying, Hey, are many Scotties over yonder? So the Australian said, No, no. He said, Well, we have a few, but our principal pests are rabbits. My grandfather, Leonard Crocom, was a friend of Lord Reith's. He did have a real kind of knack for doing journalism and, and an involvement in the BBC. Leonard Crocom there, and Justin Webb from Radio 4's Today. He is the grandson of Leonard Crocom, who made his debut on March the 14th, 1923, six months before becoming the first editor of the Radio Times. You can hear more about Justin Webb and Leonard Crocom, radio grandfather and grandson, on episode 46 of this podcast. Looking more at the listings then, later that night, entertainer Gordon Marsh does children impersonations. Yes. The next day, the entertainment included uh, comedian Rupert O'Hay performing auto-suggestions and Shakespeare snapshotted. No, I have no idea either. I wish it was recorded. And the day after that, March the 16th, 30 BBC staff left the 30 foot by 15 foot room of Magnet House for Savoy Hill, the first BBC headquarters closed. There was no fanfare on air, no mention of it that we know of, but hey, it was March the 16th and the two bobs were on, and nothing replaces the two bobs. The official opening of Savoy Hill wasn't till May. You see, they had to not only leave Magnet House, they had to leave Marconi House, the studio as well, and make sure Savoy Hill was fit for purpose. So we'll be celebrating Savoy Hill properly here in a very grand celebration in a few episodes' time. Before then, we've got at least half a dozen episodes I'd love to bring you on uh, Major Arthur Corbett Smith, the bizarre Cardiff station director, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, not that one, who had jurisdiction of Children's Hour and Women's Programmes. We'll be hearing from Dr Amy Holdsworth and Dr Kate Murphy in that episode. 
episode. We'll be hearing about the struggles between John Reith, the Daily Express, and the Postmaster General. That happened in April 1923. We'll look at early Shakespeare and indeed reassess early radio drama with Dr. Andrea Smith and Professor Tim Crook. We may also get a chance to look at music with Percy Pitt, early BBC musical maestro. And around then, I've got to bring you interviews with Johnny Beerling, ex Radio 1 boss, Alec Reid, uh, David Hamilton. Lots of interviews I've recorded all about music at the Beeb. As for next episode, though, the first daily weather broadcasts and the SOS broadcasts, remember those. Plus a glimpse into the world of archives with former BBC archivist Simon Rooks. That is a fascinating discussion. You do not want to miss that. Before we go, though, let's hear one more time from this week's wonderful guest, the delightful comedy legend that is Geoffrey Holland. And did you know that Geoffrey Holland was in a radio sitcom about the Savoy Hill days of the BBC? Well, it was only four episodes, but it was called London Calling for Jimmy Perry. Jimmy was quite keen on uh, getting that onto the screen, but of course it was too expensive to, to possibly film. Of course. Um, I've got the cast list here in front of me, and I've listened to this marvellous sitcom, London Calling by Jimmy Perry. Um, so you were playing Roger Eccles. Yes. Um, who is, uh, and, and all of the names... They all relate to real-life BBC pioneers. So that must be Roger Eckersley, who was director of programmes at the very start. Yes, um, so Jimmy, Jimmy did the research, you know. Yeah. Very, very keen to get things right. Well, in fact, when I listen to it, there are direct lines of dialogue, which I've read in the biographies I've got here behind me, and John Reith's biography and Cecil Lewis, the first pioneers. So he clearly, he done he, he got those books, you know, and, and he's looking through and going, that's a great line, we'll have that. That's a great character, we'll have that. He wanted, really wanted it to be on television, but because of you know the nature of the beast uh, and the period costume, it would have been too expensive to make, and he wouldn't have got a, a commission for it. Mm. But, you know, he, he got it out of his system, and we four episodes on the radio, which was great fun. Yeah, the character kept saying things like, "When I was with Marconi." Yeah, yeah. Well, the truth, the real life, the uh, Roger Eckersley was a failed chicken farmer before he joined the BBC as director of programmes. So uh, you know, so even that's got comedy sort of sewn into it somehow. But chicken farmer. Yeah. That's- in itself, isn't it? I don't know how you've failed to farm chickens, but there's a whole, the mind boggles. Well, thank you for lifting us throughout your career, selling back to us nostalgia, but lifting us as we go. We're always going back into the past and cheering along our way. Well, absolute pleasure. You know, I've been a very lucky man. I know I have. Long may it continue for as long as I can walk and breathe. Well, thank you, Jeffrey Holland. And he is on tour. Do look at his website, find out where his Stan Laurel tribute show is coming near you. Speaking of live shows, I'm doing a few this year, recreating the first religious broadcast. If you head to paulcarenza.com slash tour, you can see all about that. And indeed, if you'd like my more general touring show, an evening of very old radio, do get in touch, paul at paulcarenza.com. I am available for your venue, event, conference. I'll be delighted to wax lyrical about early radio where you are. Well, thank you for listening. If you like us, share us, do rate, review. That would be lovely. You can interact with us on social media, Facebook and Twitter. If you really like us, and if you've got a fiver to spare each month, join us on patreon.com slash paulcarenza, where you get extra videos, writings, behind-the-scenes things, and the reading of Broadcasting from Within by Cecil Lewis. We're doing it bit by bit, with lots of interruptions as we go. That's a fiver a month, but for free, another episode will follow this one soon enough, telling the tale of spring 1923, the first weather and SOS broadcasts here on the British Broadcasting Century, presented and produced by me, Paul Carenza. Original music is by Will Farmer. The archive material is so old it's generally public domain. The BBC content is used with kind permission. BBC copyright content reproduced courtesy the British Broadcasting Corporation. All rights are reserved, but we are nothing to do with today's BBC. BBC. We're just talking about them, not with them as such. Do stay informed, educated and entertained and join us next time for archives, weather and SOS broadcasts at the other end of this British broadcasting century.